Valentine's Day is a good time to share God the Father's great love. That's his heart. And while the world talks about love, they and perhaps we really don't know what love is all about. In our day and age, it can mean many different things. Our English word for love is sort, sort of broad. It covers everything from love for our children to love for our spouse to love for God. I mean, it just covers everything, and it's varying degrees of that. You can say, you know, I love you, brother, which means, you know, to a friend, uh, you know, a buddy, and that means a different thing than what it means when you say I love your, when you say you love your spouse or your girlfriend. It definitely means something different than loving God. True love is a, an expression of our heart toward another. It comes from the heart and goes to toward them. And to share our love with another can make us very vulnerable very vulnerable, but love, love must uh, take risk. Love must take risk. And uh, it's real easy for us to say that, and yet if anyone has ever loved, they know that it's a risk. The very uh, statement to say to uh, a girlfriend is, I love you, is a risk-taking event because you don't know what the response would be. But it's the same way when we show our love toward other people. Love is an expression of God's heart. The Father's heart is expressed throughout all the Bible. In 1 John, uh, we are told that God is love. That is, it's so much of His character that when you truly see what love is, you see God. And there's a great tension between God's love and His justice. Because God is always just. He's totally just. He's never going to do anything that will compromise His justice. But He's also pure love in that He loves uh, everyone. And so there's that tension. But God expresses His love for all of us in those good things that He gives us. And, you know, the sunshine, the rain, the, the flowers, the trees friends, uh, uh, a bed to sleep on at night, all these things are gifts from God. And so before we begin, let, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to bless our time together. We're going to be looking at His love this morning and how to express it to other people. Heavenly Father, open our hearts to receive from You Your Word. I thank you, Father, that you are so expressive of your love throughout all the scriptures, but also in our own hearts. Now, Father, bless this time that we have together. May you glorify yourself in all that's said and done. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're a Christian, then you have experienced the greatest expression of God's love through the gift of Jesus Christ, His Son. Now, that's the Father's heart expressed so perfectly and so ideally. It deals with the judgment in. It also deals with His compassion and love. You see, the Bible tells us in Psalm 103, verse 10, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. If he had dealt with us that way, then we'd all just all would wind up in hell. And no more, probably nowhere, is that more expressed than in what is called the gospel in a nutshell, which is John 3, 16. And we've all heard it. And you've seen it on signs at football games and other events. People have as uh, assembles inside of their uh, uh, window of their car. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I, I love that verse. I, I love it. It's, uh, I can remember the first time someone pointed that verse out to me from the Bible. It was before I was saved, and and uh, uh, Wilda Capehart said to me, Ricky, have you ever heard of John 
And then she quoted it to me. She quoted that verse to me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I didn't have any idea about that verse up until that day, but she shared it to me. And it has the same expression of God's love uh, as uh, Romans 5.8, because 5.8 tells us, Romans 5.8 says, God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's God's love for the sinner. It's so wonderful. That love of God for the sinner is remarkable because God is holy and without any taint of sin. Yet he says he loves everyone and he wants everyone to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as a child of God, my heart should be like my father's heart. But often it isn't. And I think we have to examine ourselves from time to time and take a look at where we stand with the Father. And when we pray, you know, such as what it says in the Lord's Prayer, uh, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. One of the things he wants us to have is a character, his characteristic of love in our own lives. We need to demonstrate his love toward other people. But that's sometimes a flaw in our Christian character. It's the defining characteristic of God the Father, and it should be the defining characteristic of uh, every one of us who put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to pray that our love would grow stronger, and we ought to pray that our love would reach out to other people. In fact, 1 John uh, uh, 4, 8 tells us, But he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And in fact, if our love is so deficient that it's, it's not there, that it's no love in our lives, then we don't know God, is what the Bible is trying to tell us. Yet we are expected to show God's wonderful love to the world. But we can't even show it among ourselves, among our brethren in Christ. That's one of the things that stirred me over the years. I, I know I know people who who uh, are Christians, a Christian home, Christian family, and yet the, the love is not there for a member of the family. There's there's a, a, a I don't want to say hatred love among people who claim to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we say we love the lost, then we are deficient in showing it. Because who do we tell? Most Christians go throughout their entire Christian life, lay their bed on their last night on earth, and go to, off into eternity to be with the Lord Jesus, but never told, tell one person about the Lord Jesus Christ. Not even their loved ones that they love so dearly. And I think many times we as Christians fall into the trap of looking at a person and saying, you know, that's a good person. Surely God would accept them. Surely they're already Christians. I, I really don't need to talk to them about Christ. Well, yes, we do. We are commanded to talk, to open our mouths. In fact, Paul prayed that, uh, asked for prayer that he, that words would be given him that he might open his mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Words are important. It's not just our lives we've got to show, but it's our words we have to give. When we set aside our lame excuses, there's only one reason that we can't uh, don't bring Christ to those that we claim to love. Only one reason. We don't love Jesus enough to tell them. And I, this struck home to me. I, I realized that I, I often share uh, little tidbits about uh, my best friend who's gone to be with the Lord in glory. Uh, and I often, without any hesitancy, I, you know, I'll say, well, you know, Ed did this, Ed did that, Ed, uh, Ed showed me so many things and taught me so many things. But I wonder how often do I so freely share those things that God through the Lord Jesus Christ has shown me and, and tell to other people. 
Now, if there's people out there, I wonder, who know that I'm a Christian. Forget that I'm a pastor. I want them to know that I'm a Christian. I want them to have an awareness of that. I don't want to be secret about my love for the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope I can brag on Him uh, without any hesitancy. Uh, and to use an old word we despise today, it's time that we repent and return to our first love, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. To return, to come home, to be with the Lord Jesus and do what He would have us to do. Now I want to get into the brunt of my message. That is all leading to what I wanted to bring up now. How are we to share the love of God our Father? How are we as Christians to express the love of God to those who are around us? How are we to get that message out and get it out clearly? There's two things I think Christians need to pray for. One thing is we need to pray that we would have clarity when we give the gospel out. The other thing, along with the Apostle Paul, that we would pray that would be bold in proclaiming that gospel. Those two things have become very difficult in our day. We, we tend to get so caught up in everything else. We're so quick to talk about politics. Uh, if I were to ask uh, your friends, do you know who, uh, what party so-and-so is aligned with? You know, is he a Republican or conservative or is he a liberal or a Democrat or is he a uh, libertarian or is he a communist? You know, your friends would be able to tell me, pre I'm pretty sure, what you are. But so many people have no idea what, who we stand for concerning, the, uh, concerning God in the Lord Jesus Christ. One way to do that is to use John 3.16. We all know... We, we pretty well memorized it. I can say, I can paraphrase it. God loved the world so much that He gave us His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. I can even expound on it. I can go even beyond that. I can, I can get into details with it. What that love is like, what God had to do, what He, he shares. But we need to get that message out to people. And it helps to diagram or draw a picture when you're explaining John 3.16. You know, a lot of people are audio learners. They hear what they hear, they, they absorb, but most people aren't. A lot of people have to have some kind of visual in order for them to understand what you're talking about. So you draw them a picture. And the picture can be... Uh, uh, as uh, uh, we have on the back of our bulletin today, I don't uh, see, yes, here, here it is, and it uh, actually lays it out. In fact, it's called John 3.16, One Verse Method, and it get, gives you a diagram, and you can follow that diagram. You can show them what God's love is all about. But the first thing that we need to do is to tell them that God loves everyone in the world. That they're not isolated. God does not hate them. God loves them. A lot of people feel like, well, I've done so much bad. God surely doesn't love me. They have the attitude or the, the thought that God is up there ready to strike them down any moment. But God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Look at what he did for the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was Saul of Tarsus who went around putting Christians into prisons because they put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, God loved him and called him and, and saved him. And, and Paul said, I'm constrained or I, I'm controlled by the love of God found in Christ Jesus. And so... First thing to tell them is God loves everyone in the world. He loves them despite them being in rebellion against Him through their sin. Uh, they, they're in rebellion. They, they're, they're doing everything wrong. You know, one of the things I found a, a, a thing to do is when you talk to somebody about Jesus and you start talking about sin, a lot of people have a hard time understanding what sin is. 
Now, sin, it can be described in any ways. The Bible says that uh, uh, trespassing the law is sin. Violating the law is sin. So, if you've ever told a lie, well, there you are. You, you've sinned. If you've ever stolen anything, no matter uh, how uh, valuable, it's sin. And so, you have to help them to get to understanding that. But most people understand they're not right with God. And if you change it around a little bit and, and ask, are you far or near, most people are going to say, I'm far from God. And so we want to help them get close to God so that God can do His work in them. So we're going to talk to them about sin, but understand that God loves them despite their sin. Secondly, God loves them so much that He doesn't want them to perish in the rebellion and sin, but he, he would have that they would have eternal life. He wants them to live forever. Not only to just to live physically forever uh, in heaven, but to have a relationship with Him. We are separated from God because of our sin. And He wants to bring them into back into a right relationship. Thirdly, in order to rescue them, God did something for them. You know, a lot of people say, and, and Alice demonstrated this the other day when we were doing the, the little skit. A lot of people say, well, you know, I, I need to clean my life up before I can be acceptable to God. And that's not true. Find me an example in the Bible where that took place. The leper came to Jesus. He didn't stop being a leper before he came to Jesus. He came to Jesus so that Jesus could heal him of his leprosy. Leprosy is always illustrated as a type of what sin does to a person. And when a person who is uh, forgiven, it's just like the leprosy being cleansed from the leper. It's gone away. They're brand new. And that's what we need to help them understand. God did something for us. Not something they need to do, but what God has done for them. He sent Jesus, you can go into detail, sent Jesus from heaven, His only Son, born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem's manger. He grew up, lived a holy life, and died on the cross in our place. He did that to rescue us from our sins and to help them to understand that He rose again and He's ready to receive them as, their, uh, as His own if they will just turn in faith to them. God did all that for us. Finally, all that is needed is that we turn in faith to Jesus Christ. A lot of people say, well, you know, I've, I've got to do this, 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 and this. I've got to go clean up my life. I've got to uh, uh, find me a church to join, and, and I've got to be baptized. I've got to get all this out of the way before God will accept me. No, it, it's, it's really very simple. It's as simple as simple faith, childlike faith even. Uh, Christ simply wants us to turn in faith to Him and to trust, simply trust Jesus to save us and to bring us to God the Father. That's God's heart. And we're expressing God's heart with John 3, 16. And it's all there. It's all there. For God so loved the world. The first part tells us He loves everyone. He loves the world. Now, he does, let, me, let me say this. When we say the world, we're not talking about this physical world that we live in today. Most people don't realize this, but this world we live in today is going to cease to be. It's going away. God is going to completely destroy it. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. This is going away. But those who put their faith in Jesus will abide forever. God loves people and wants them to be saved. And that we should not perish. He doesn't want us to perish. He doesn't want us to go to hell, but He wants us to have everlasting life. And then He gave His only begotten Son. He gave us the gift of His Son. And we need that gift in order for us to have everlasting life. And the, the whosoever, I love that whosoever, whosoever uh, 
meaneth me. There's a song that says that whosoever meaneth me, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? All in that one verse. <coughs> and at this point, uh, we would invite them to trust in Jesus as the Lord and Savior after we presented it. Answer any questions that you can that they might have. Set, uh, give, give time to them because sometimes we're in such a rush that we won't get things done and move on. But no, we need to spend time with people because God wants people to be saved and to become His children. And if they accept the invitation and trust in Jesus, then we need to begin training them to tell others about Jesus and begin their walk in life. And we're, so we're down the line, we're going to talk about that because that what we tend to do is we get them saved, we think that, well, they'll join a church somewhere. Well, no, we, we need to... They're babies. What do babies need? Babies need a lot of care. And if they put their faith in Jesus, they are... New creations, they've been born again, and they've got to have that care so that they will grow properly. But if they don't decide to trust in Jesus, what most of us do is say, okay, uh, that's good, uh, have a nice day, and, and we move right along. But what we need to do is to see if they would be willing to meet with you and, and, and to study the Bible so that they can see God's loving heart for them. That they can get to know God in a safe environment. More likely their home or across the table at, at, a, uh, at the uh, uh, restaurant or somewhere like that. Where they can quietly ask questions and be instructed and guide them in their early steps of being a Christian. And on to full discipleship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And help them to see that love that God uh, has shown toward them and remind them of what they have just done. Sometimes we react uh, as though uh, they've rejected Jesus when they, they don't put their faith in Him immediately. Well, it may be they're just legitimate. And I, I've asked this question before, but you know, and I'll bring it up again. I mean, how many of us came to faith in Jesus the first time we heard the gospel. I know I didn't. When uh, Wilma Capehart gave me John 3.16, I remember it, and I still remember it to this day. It was in her home that she told me that, and, and I remember it, but that wasn't when I got saved. It was later that I got saved. I didn't know. I, I, God had to work on my heart. And so... Uh, it's not a red light that we receive when someone uh, initially says that uh, uh, they're not ready to make a decision. It may be just a yellow light that says they're a little cautious and they want to have more information. They're not just going to jump into something. And we have to respect a person who takes time to uh, have things figured out and explain to them. We've got to do that. And what we need to do as best we can to explain it. Now, what do you do if somebody is a truly a red light and, and, and says, you know, I don't want to hear about this. I have no interest in this. I want you to get away from me. You get away from them. I'll share an instance. Back years ago in, in Marshall, Texas, I, I, I was going various different places. I was witnessing to just about anybody like me. And we were in the uh, local mall, and um, uh, I sat down with a young man. Oh, probably he was 16 or so, uh, about that age. And I was uh, going through the Roman roads with him, and I was talking to him. And, and I heard somebody uh, come up behind me, and they said, Don't talk to him about that. If I want him to hear that, I'll tell him. And I turned around and he, uh, I said, yeah, sir, he said, I'm his father. If I want him to hear this kind of stuff, I'll tell him myself. And I said, okay. I, and I stopped talking to him. And I turned around and I started talking to the father. And he was very belligerent at that point and wouldn't hear. And I, I, and I, uh, I used to do this. I don't do it very often anymore. But I, I said, sir, 
you know, I really just tried to tell you how you can know God and His forgiveness. But would you please release me from the responsibility of you going to hell? Because one day you're going to remember this moment as you stand before God and He shows you your life. This moment is going to come up and you're going to regret it. I just wanted to bring it home that, that this was a serious thing. He said, yeah, 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 I'll take responsibility. And what do you do? You just walk away. You can't do anything else. You just can't do anything else but pray for them. And I hope and pray that that gentleman later on came to faith in Jesus. Uh, we don't want to force uh, the gospel upon anyone that doesn't want to hear it. But there are those who want to hear, and we want to give that message to His son was listening, by the way. His son wanted to hear. And I hope that someone was able later to bring that message to him. God's love demands that we always make sure and follow through on the proper assistance whether they come to Christ or not. If they, they don't come to Christ at that moment, it's not a shut door. If they're willing to open the door for further discussion and, and uh, they allow you to come to their house or they say, I'll, I'll meet you so and so and we'll have dinner and we can talk about this some more and you can take the Bible and, and show them that's what we need to do. And we need to help them as best we can. I think we as Christians love John 3.16. I know I do. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And I, I go to it often. In those years gone by when, when I was struggling with doubts uh, during those seasons, uh, this is one of the verses that was my touchstone. For God so loved the world. That means he loved me, and that he gave his only son, that whosoever, and that whosoever means me, believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that gave me encouragement and strength through those times of doubt, because I knew who I put my trust in. I know whom I believe, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And so I love that verse, it, because it shows the Father's heart for all mankind. He loves everyone. And beyond that, He loves us. And if we know ourselves, we have to question sometimes, Father, how can you love me? Father, I mess up every day. I fail all the time. Why do you love me? But yet it does express His love, not only for the world, but also for us. God loves all the people in the world and is not willing that any should perish. And no matter who they are or how far from God they are, He wants them to come to God. He wants them to come home. And it's such a simple message that everyone should hear. So simple. And we should give it out. And we have to remember, God is the one who does the work. It's not us. God is the one who, who does. No man comes to Jesus except the Father draw him. That's what Jesus said. They have to be drawn to the Father by, by God the Father. And how does the Father do it? He uses his Holy Spirit to draw them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we do what we have to do. And that God does what only he can do. And that is to bring them to Jesus. And I hope that if you are far from God, that you will hear the good news in John 3.16. That you'd hear it and turn in faith to the Lord Jesus. And if you're having struggles about it, I understand this day and age, there's so many messages floating around out there. Enough. But let me guarantee you, He will save you and bring you home to the Father who loves you despite anything that you may have done. He loves you, and through Jesus, He will bring you home to Himself. You may consider yourself the prodigal in the pits of the pig pen, but He will receive you back through the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you put your faith in Jesus and come home to the Father? Will you do it? I pray that you will. I pray that you will.